It is no wonder that today is a day that a lot of the world chooses to celebrate. Because today is the anniversary of the greatest event that has ever happened in the history of the world. Now, I hope you were able to follow that little video. Um, if you weren't, go to thebibleproject.com. It's all free. You can look it up, watch it again. Because the idea there was what I really want to talk about this morning. And I, they draw better than I do, so I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, Sometimes when we talk about the resurrection, sometimes when we talk about the death of Jesus, we fall a little short of actually grasping what was actually happening. Now, I love the way Dan in the communion talk talked about, you know, listening to music sometimes takes you where you're there. You know, it takes you to that moment. It lets you see that moment. This moment, when this door opened, it's hard to grasp. Because it had never happened before in the history of the world. And as of yet, it hasn't happened fully again. But when that door opened, something changed. Now, before we get to that, let's stop and think about what the world was like before this door opened. This is a tomb, by the way. If y'all can't tell. All right? I'm going to give props to my prop shop for doing that for me. That was awesome. Uh, before that door opened, this was the end for everybody. You went into a place like that, you never came out. This was what the world seemed to be all about. The world was messed up. The world was hurting. Sickness, disease, death. It was just a fact of life. And there wasn't a whole lot to look forward to past that point. But yet the Jews, God's people, uh, a culture that he created himself through their prophets, through their writings, through their teachings, they had a hope. A hope that someday somebody was going to come and set everything right again. They called this person the Messiah. God's chosen king. The, the, the person that God is going to rule through because that was the whole point of Israel is God was supposed to be in charge. Now Israel was terrible at that. In fact, the whole Old Testament, if you've been in our uh, Wednesday night classes where we're going through the story of the Bible, we've been going through the judges and first and second Samuel and we're getting into the kings and man, they stunk at being God's people. They were always messing up, always going the wrong way, always ignoring God. But yet the prophets would remind them, hey, somebody better is coming, and they're going to bring a new hope. They're going to bring something better than we have so far. And then one day, Jesus showed up. And he started teaching, and he started talking. He started healing people. Man, I wish I could see that. Now, I've seen the, the televangelist on TV slapping people on the forehead. I'm pretty sure that's not how Jesus did it. In fact, he just walked through a town sometimes. People would reach out just to touch him. And just touching Jesus healed people. Just coming up to Jesus and saying, my child is sick. Please come and heal them. Jesus didn't even have to go heal them. He had to say, go home. Your child's fine. Jesus was something different. When he spoke, you heard God. Where he walked, you saw God. When he touched people, they experienced God. But then, as the video earlier said, something seemed to go terribly wrong. They took this king, they took this Messiah, they took this person that was doing these incredible things and out of jealousy, out of greed, out of arrogance, the same things we still struggle with today, they nailed him on a cross. They killed him. Actually, that's not true. They didn't kill Jesus. They couldn't kill Jesus. Jesus had been very clear. Nobody could take his life from him. Had he not allowed it, no nail would have ever pierced his hand. That spear they shoved in his side after he was dead couldn't have pierced his skin. I mean, remember, remember, we're talking about the guy who walked on water. 
We're talking about the guy who calmed thunderstorms with a single word. We're talking about the guy who said to a dead child, get up. And they got up. Or to dead Lazarus, come out. He came out. We're talking about the guy who could feed thousands of people with a few loaves and a couple of fish. Man, I wish we would have had him with us at LTC. Would have made it so much easier. They couldn't kill him. He gave himself. He allowed himself to die. And in that death, it had to seem to those who believed at that point that everything had gone completely wrong. We know it seemed that way to him. You read the biblical account, all of his apostles, his closest friends, we call them apostles, these were his buddies. These were the people who spent three years walking and talking and living and laughing and loving and, you know, just living life with Jesus. And all of a sudden, he's gone. And they don't know what to do. They're lost. Death claimed even the king they had been looking for. But then in John chapter 20, I want us to look at part of this together. And I'm going to jump down and start in verse 11. Jesus has been in the tomb Friday evening, all day Saturday, it's Sunday morning. Now, if you get worried about, wait, wasn't Jesus supposed to be dead for three days? To a Jew, that is three days. Part of Friday, all day Saturday, part of Sunday. They didn't get all obnoxious about 24-hour days the way we tend to. That wasn't the way their mind worked. Three days in the grave means part of Friday, part of Saturday, part of Sunday. That's three days. But when that third day came, they went to the tomb because they didn't really get to take care of his body fully before they buried him. They had to end before the Sabbath. No work was allowed to be done on the Sabbath. So just preliminary care was given. His body was taken and it was laid in a stone tomb in a garden. And a stone weighing thousands of pounds. They didn't have no clue how strong hands to just move that. A stone weighing thousands of pounds was set in front of that tomb. And a guard was posted, like in the passage that was already read. A guard was posted to make sure nobody came to steal the body of Jesus. Because they knew he had told about himself, I'll be dead for three days, then I'm coming back. The powers that be didn't want anybody to have a chance to let that rumor spread. But when the ladies came to the tomb early Sunday morning, the rock was moved, the guards were gone. And they were worried. They were worried somebody stole Jesus' body. And they, how would you feel if your loved one died and someone came and stole their body and took them away and you didn't know where they were anymore? I mean, these ladies were distraught. And then in John chapter 20, starting in verse 11, let me read from here. Now Mary, this is Mary Magdalene, a person whom Jesus had healed, who had experienced God through Jesus, whose life had been made so much better by Jesus, she comes to the tomb. Peter and John had also come to the tomb, found it empty. Peter and John leave. Mary sticks around. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Angels ask funny questions. They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this she turned and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener. I love that. Thinking he was the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned towards him and she cried out in Aramaic, which would have actually been her normal language. Rabboni, teacher. Jesus said, don't hold on to me. 
I've not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went away to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them he had said these things to her. First off, just to clarify, Jesus didn't say to Mary, don't touch me. I know that's how some of the translations translate it. What he said is, quit clinging to me. It's like she fell down at his feet and she wrapped her arms around his legs and the person she thought was dead was alive. You think she was ever going to let him go? No. So he said, Mary, let me go. I've got somewhere I have to be. I have to go to my father and your father. Now notice how he says this. Through most of Scripture, when he refers to God, he will, refer, he will always refer to God as his Father. That is God everybody's Father? Yeah. But something's changed. Something very important has changed. He said, I'm going to my Father and your Father. To my Lord and your Lord. And go tell my brothers. You see, when the tomb opened, the world changed. Because the world that had been dominated by sin and death, the world that had no hope, all of a sudden there was something new working. There was a, a, a complete new reality at work in the world. A reality that had existed a long time ago, but that had been lost and couldn't even be remembered. You know, when God created the world, talked about this in that video a little bit. When God created the world, the world and heaven were not two different places. Because where was God? He was walking and talking with Adam and Eve. Where God is, is where heaven is. Heaven's not a zip code that God moves to. God is heaven. If you're in his presence, you are in heaven. That's, that's just the word we use to talk about where God is. And used to, God was with us. So where we were was heaven. The Garden of Eden was both heaven and earth. But our sin, our rebellion, our arrogance, because arrogance was a big part of it, it ruined it. It split where we were and where God was. And heaven and earth became two very different things. But when the door opened, things began to change again. Think about the kingdom of God for a second. You were told Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand. And actually, by the time he's res resurrected, he says the kingdom of God is here. God's presence is here. Heaven, which is another word for it, is here. But what is God's kingdom? What is the difference? That's occurred. Well, God's kingdom. Come on. <laughs> is faith, hope, love, joy, peace. I could keep going on. God's kingdom is where those qualities have taken control. Those are the qualities of Jesus. That's how Jesus lived his life, wasn't it? Walking around, sharing God's love, sharing mercy, sharing justice, sharing hope. That's God's kingdom. And those qualities that have been driven out of the world that no longer, that were always on the rocks, always being put down, always falling short. All of a sudden they had power in the world again. But let me ask the question. What does this mean to you? What does this mean to me? Great philosophical discussion, right? The tomb opened. The world changed. What do I do tomorrow when I go back to work? I'm going to come back to this here in a second. Jesus' uh, resurrection was the beginning, not the end of the story. It's where something new started. We 
get to choose now, however, because that door opened, because that rock rolled away, now we get to choose which part we're going to play. Do we become agents of the kingdom? Do we live in a little piece of heaven on earth? Now, I'm not, please don't misunderstand me. When I say I get to live in a little piece of heaven on earth, I don't mean that sickness, disease, trouble, problems, that all that goes away. Right? That's going to happen one day. Jesus is going to come back. He's going to finish the job. He's made that promise. That's our faith. But right now, I still get to experience heaven because I get to experience God's presence, even in the middle of all this mess. So that when I face trouble, when I face problems, when I face whatever, I still have the joy, the love, the faith, the hope. I still have heaven even in the middle of a messed up world. But now I get to choose. Do I become part of heaven? Or do I stay part of hell? Which is what the world is slowly and has been descending into. Turn your Bibles over to Romans chapter 6. Last passage. Or you can just watch up there, either way. When you get a chance, though, read it in your own Bible. That way when you see it at home, it looks familiar to you. In Romans chapter 6, Paul writes this. After talking about, hey, we get to be in Christ. We get to be something new. So he's sort of answering a rhetorical question. All right, we're saved by grace. It's through grace. It's through God's free gift. It's through God's mercy that we get to be a part of of this heavenly thing. That we get to be a part of that open tomb. So he asked the rhetorical question. Okay, then what do we say? We go on sinning so that there's more grace? <laughs> Paul's answer is very enlightening. He says, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? That's what our baptism means. Yeah, it's just water. No, there's nothing miraculous about it, but there is something supernatural about it. Because it's in that moment when we descend into the water, we're asking God, God, please make me something new. I wanna, I'm giving you everything I have. I am dying to myself. But Paul says, don't you know if you've done that, you've been buried with Christ. And if we, and, uh, we were therefore buried with him through baptism, lose my place, into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So we die with him, we get buried. We go into the tomb the way he went into the tomb. Now, he made it a lot easier. We didn't face physical death to do this. We don't go into a tomb of rock or cardboard or whatever. We go into a watery grave. But just like he came out of that tomb, Paul is saying, we've come out of the tomb. If you're buried with him, you're also resurrected with them. Now, a lot of times we pause here and we think, okay, yeah, one day, wherever I get buried, assuming Jesus doesn't come first, someday God's bringing me out of that grave, right? Say amen. Say it again because it didn't sound like you meant it. God will one day bring us out of the grave physically. But right now, he has already done it spiritually. If we've been buried with him, now we get to live with him. That's Paul's point. We can't go on sinning in this world. We can't go on living like the rest of the world, promoting injustice and sin and evil desires and all those other things because that's not who we are anymore. We've passed out of that life into a new one. Keep looking. Just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we, may, we too may live a new life. For we have been united with him in a death like his. We will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. That's why we entered the tomb. 
Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also will live for him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you were not under the law. And pay very close attention to this last part. You are not under the law, but under grace. This tomb over here, what it represents is a change. A change that is very hard to wrap our minds around. You see, now, because that tomb opened, because that Sunday morning, 2,000 and whatever years ago. I'm not that good at math. Y'all can figure it out. The world changed. Sin was condemned. Death lost its teeth. Victory was won. And now we each play a part in that victory. We each get to decide how we're going to live. With the additional assurance that the part left undone will be taken care of someday soon. That he's not going to leave it the way it is. But the restoration of heaven and earth will be fully completed when he returns. Until then, we're his agents again. Until then, we're his brothers and sisters. Until then, it's our job to take this heaven back out into this world because the world needs it. How many people do you know right now who struggle with depression, guilt, fear, who are slaves to their own desires and can't seem to break bad habits, who struggle to know what's going to happen tomorrow, who are so lost in pursuing things that they think they want, but by the time they get them, it doesn't work for them anymore. How many people do you know like that? You know what the answer to their problem is? It was the same answer to your problems. They need heaven and not hell. And I'm not talking about the ultimate end. I'm talking about right now. Which do we live in? Do we live in God's presence or do we live outside? If we live outside, death and corruption and pain and suffering and all of that is all there's ever going to be. But if we live in God's presence, then we have hope and joy and peace and assurance regardless of what's going on. That's the story of that tomb. That's the story of that rock rolling away. The world changed. And now we are given the opportunity to change with it. Have you changed? Have you died to yourself to embrace a new life? I think most of us in here probably have. If you haven't, then here in a second, we're going to sing an invitation song. If you need help doing that, let us help you. That's what we're here for. It's God who's going to do it. All you actually have to do is submit. Give in. Let God take control. But for the rest of us, are we living each day like it's heaven? You know, for those who are at LTC this weekend, and we had 120, 124 people there. We had a big group. It was sort of fun. People saw our t-shirts everywhere. One thing I love about stuff like that, we were in this big hotel in downtown Dallas. 
We're right outside the downtown. Thousands of people, I think it's something like 2,000 kids, something like that, just at this hotel. That's the kids. That's not all the parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and everybody else. So thousands of people running around this hotel like mad people. But yet we were all brothers and sisters. And the longer you were there, the more you could feel it. The way people responded to you, the conversations that popped up on an elevator as you were huffing and puffing and running up and down stairs because you couldn't afford to wait for the elevator. Or you're sitting in the common room stuffing your face with sandwiches and people walk up and just start talking because there was this sense we all belonged. That even in that chaos, there was a little heaven present. That's the choice God gives us. Live in that or live in the other. And I don't recommend the other.